is a widely recognized health and medical writer, consultant, and lecturer on addiction and on healthy relating. He has created courses on these subjects at Cape Cod Community College. Tom is the author of Up in Smoke, Addicted, and Improving Intimacy. He also writes the popular Cape Cod Times advice column on addiction. Now, Tom O'Connell. Hi, welcome to Understanding Addiction. We're going to be talking about meditation today. And why? Because this is a, a way out of addiction. It's a remedy for addiction, actually. Addiction impairs all of our relationships, the relationship to self, the relationship to other people, and other creatures and the planet itself, and it, it, it impairs our relationship to God, our, our higher power. Addiction complicates life, complicates it very much. And we're going to look at a graphic that shows all the different kinds of addictions that we can get involved in. These and many more. Addiction to work, power, alcohol, various substances, gambling, drugs, food, tobacco, fame, perfection, almost anything. We can become addicted to almost anything that makes us feel good, even for a few moments. And we can want to go back and chase that high, that, that, that feeling of, of being in charge and feeling good. Uh, we're going to also go through now a, a little set of triangles to demonstrate what happens to us when we are addicted. We've got a series of graphics, and this is what happens to us. Ad addiction is, is a kind of, a, of a, a separating force, and in these triangles, the A stands for addiction, and it separates us from ourself, that's the S, from others, that's the O in these triangles, and G separates us from God. And recovery is, is the next step. Once, once we get beyond our addictions into recovery, we flatten out those triangles and we develop straight line relationships with self, others, and with God. And that's what the addiction recovery process is all about, is getting rid of that separating, alienating influence. And in the third graphic, it's an illustration showing us that we're, we have a basic emptiness in us and it goes with the human condition. And when we try to fill it, that's when we get addicted. There's no way to really fill that emptiness. We'll get into that a little bit later in more depth. And then the final triangle, we talk about addiction recovery, and, well, we're not into the triangle yet. We're on the road to recovery, and that's admitting the problem, surrendering to it, getting help, and changing our behavior. And ultimately, we come to another solution that we call the spiritual solution, and that, that's the only answer that I know of to the addictive process. And that's why addiction recovery programs based on spirituality are so successful. What's this emptiness all about that I'm talking about? What's this emptiness that we're craving to fill? Well, I think it goes back to what we're basically made of, you know, who we really are. Um, I don't believe I'm a body that has a spiritual part. I believe I'm a spirit that has a body and is temporarily living, living in that body. I have physical appetites. And they're almost endless. Um, I need liquid, I need food, I need relationships. I need all kinds of things in my life to take care of this body. But what about my spirit? Uh, there's a quote that I love, and it comes from St. Augustine. And St. Augustine was quite an addict, by the way. But the quote is, Lord, you made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Now, I find that a wonderful quotation. Augustine was addicted to food, among other things, and he, and he had a number of addictions. He, was, he had sexual addiction, and he gradually overcame these, eventually through spiritual discipline. And that was his solution, and that was many centuries ago, and it's still the same basic solution today. There's a restlessness that we have, it's natural, and there's a craving to do something about it, and that's natural. We're not talking about evil, we're talking about natural things, natural appetites. And the question is, how do we arrive at moderation or sometimes abstinence when necessary? The 12-step programs, I believe, help us deal with the emptiness and the craving. And they do it through spiritual development, and it's called love and service. Loving one another, learning to love oneself, learning to love God, and getting away from self-centeredness. Self-centeredness is the key or the core issue of addiction. And it's to do with what I want, you know, the big, the capital I. I need, I want, and it's endless. It goes on forever, this kind of insatiable appetite. And the only thing that will fill or satisfy this craving is a spiritual development program. And the 12-step programs lead us step by step 
up to the 11th step of using prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. And then they add the words, as we understood him or understood God. Well, prayer and meditation, there's another quote that, that's also very relevant here, and it's about prayer and meditation, and that's about getting in touch with God. And at the same time, I guess, guess we should refer to Francis of Assisi's forgetting of self. That, and that's what comes through the 12-step programs. We learn to be not as caught up in ourselves. We learn to be more concerned with others. And by being more concerned with others, we actually help ourselves. It's a fascinating kind of partnership when we get involved with other people and get concerned with them. It's the opposite of some of our egotistical tendencies. And to do this, we need to work our way into a program of some kind. It doesn't have to be a 12-step program, but we need some kind of spiritual discipline in our lives, I believe. And prayer and meditation, as was stated in the 12-step, 12, 12 and Steps and 12 Traditions book, indicated that that was our way of getting into contact with God. And meditation is very practical. It's, it's a way of dealing with the craving that we have, of dealing with the problems that we have. Uh, but first, let me give you a distinction between prayer and meditation. Prayer in general, it gets complicated when you start thinking about theology, but prayer basically is when I'm asking or communicating with God, asking for something, or making a petition, uh, asking for the things that we need, the right things that we need. Meditation is a kind of opening a channel for God to enter, and it's more in the listening mode. It's just being there, just being, really. And the aim of meditation is to improve our conscious contact with God. The fruit of meditation is emotional balance, and on a, one of our quotations we just said meditation is very practical. It's spiritual, basically, but it's practical. And what it leads to is emotional balance, and emotional balance helps us to cope with life. When we get into a spiritual discipline, what we gradually move toward is a spiritual awakening, and that's the essence of the development in this 12-step programs. That awakening is an awakening to love of self, others, and God. And Carl Jung, the psychologist, noted the, the connection between alcohol, for example, alcoholism, and spirituality. They come from the same Latin word, the word spiritus in Latin. It means spirit, and we also use it about alcohol, spirits, you know, grain-neutral spirits. Same word for what Jung called the highest religious spirit as for excessive consumption of a toxic, toxic substance. So this leads me into another notion that I find fascinating, that alcoholism and other addictions are really a spiritual quest, a misguided spiritual quest. We're trying to find something to fill the emptiness that's inside of us. And we can also define the word addiction by looking at the Latin, too. There's a definition in, in Latin that leads us to the word devotion or devoted, and that's a kind of idol worship that we have when we're addicted. And also, on the flip side, ad dictum in Latin meant a prison sentence, and that's what our addictions do to us. They put us into a kind of bondage, a kind of prison of our own making. And to recover from addiction, I believe, requires a conversion of our thinking. It sometimes begins with one moment of truth, sometimes it's many moments leading up to a moment of truth. When we transcend addiction or rise above it, we free ourselves, we free our spirits. Addicts are alienated people. In recovery, they get in touch, in touch with themselves, in touch with life itself and with other people. Recovery programs, they're God-centered as opposed to self-centered. Self-centeredness, as I said before, is the core issue in all addictions. Unselfishness helps us to move out of our addictions. And meditation, I believe, is an important tool. When we meditate, it's a kind of antidote for our addictive tendencies. It relaxes our minds and bodies. It increases our awareness, our consciousness. It helps moderate the highs and lows of life. It helps with our mood swings, it helps with our behavior, it helps with our thinking processes, and it even helps with bodily illnesses and the way our body feels. In addiction, we're looking outside of ourselves for answers, we're looking to another person to make us feel good, we're looking to a drink to make us feel good, we're looking to a drug to make us feel more peaceful. In meditation, we look within, we look inside, and we go to a special place inside of us. 
I have a graphic on the addiction cycle, which is designed to show us what we're doing when we are addicted and why we want to look within. We feel discomfort, and that's natural to feel discomfort in life. We're uncomfortable beings. We look for relief, we anticipate a love object, something to make us feel better, and then that'll change our mood. And this is why we talk about mood-altering behavior or substances. We get high, we get low, we might get mellow. We escape reality for a brief time, we find some relief, then when we stop whatever the addictive process is, and we always have to stop, we end up with withdrawal symptoms, and they're very uncomfortable, and then we go back to the addiction again after feeling the discomfort, and it's an awful cycle, and it gets more and more intense as, as the years go by. In the next graphic, in the recovery process, we look at the steps that go into recovery. We, we find ourselves in self-help groups learning how to change behavior. We get therapy if we need it. We, and what's the point of all this? To get new insights about living, about relating, to develop new habits, especially the spiritual discipline habit, to develop new values which come out of our new habits of spiritual discipline. And we end up with a kind of freedom that's unimaginable when we're a victim of our addictions. Some questions about meditation. What, 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 what is meditation all about? Is it, is it meditation when I'm walking out in the woods, when I'm in nature, or when I'm examining a flower? Is it meditation when I'm hearing music, or doing exercises, even yoga exercises? Well, my belief, my personal belief, is that these, act, these are activities and they may heighten our awareness, and they may heighten our awareness of God and the universe, and that's wonderful, but the inner journey that I recommend is silent meditation, sitting silent meditation. Comes mainly out of the Far East. In America, we haven't been very good at this. We're an active people. We love to take walks and hear music and look at flowers and do exercises and stand on our heads and stand on our hands, but we're not very good at just sitting still. And sitting still, I believe, is where we get in touch with the inner spirit that's in all of us, and that's where God is. And we don't have to go outside, even though outside is fine, because God's there too. It gets very complicated when you even think about this. But silent meditation is an inner journey. And that's the meditation they're talking about in the 11th step of the 12-step program. And that's the meditation that comes to us through Buddhism and ancient Christianity and most other spiritual disciplines throughout the world and it takes courage. One caution, some people may not be helped by meditation. Some people are at risk in meditation. If you have a psychosis, if you have a serious mental problem, if you have tend to hallucinations or something on, on that, in that vein, you've got to watch yourself because meditation may bring up things in your consciousness from the unconscious and might be risky. For most people, this does not happen. For most people, the opposite happens. Meditation leads to peace of mind after the original exercises and the early months of meditation. So I think of meditation as a kind of a key to recovery. And the key to recovery is designed to heal the human spirit, and that's what meditation helps us to do. It helps us to get in touch with love and truth. And those are the kinds of things that come to us when we're meditating, an awareness of love and awareness of truth. Meditation in the Benedictine tradition that I was trained in and I've been following for many years is based on an ancient scripture from the old scriptures. It's, just, it's from a psalm actually and it's called be still and know that I am God. It just means be still, just be, just be still and know that I am God. It doesn't require any screaming, yelling, dancing, shouting, uh, endless praying. No, just be still and know that I am God. <clears throat> And in the Eastern tradition, <coughs> excuse me, it's called yoga, and all that means is a conscious contact with God, conscious union with God. And another way to describe it in our language would be alert stillness. That's what it would be. It's being alert, but being still. It's not being asleep, it's not being in a trance, but it's being still. It's, it's just being. And that brings us awareness that God is not just out there somewhere, that God is here and out there and he's within in what Jesus called the secret place, the secret place. We call it sometimes in our hearts. It's, it's a secret, we don't know where it is, but it, it, Jesus called it the secret place, and I like that description. It's, there's another description, the temple of the Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's something in us. We don't know where, it's in there. 
we can get in touch with that when we're meditating. So be still and know that I am God is a wonderful reminder to us about meditation and what the point of it all is. Now, it links with addiction because the aim of sobriety is emotional balance. People are unbalanced when they're not sober. People are unbalanced emotionally and in every other way when they're into their addictions. And emotional balance is what we want to achieve in the addic addiction recovery process. Meditation brings emotional balance. That's one of the benefits. How do you do it? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this show showing you how you meditate because it's so simple. You just sit and you close your eyes and you watch your breath and you slow down your breath and you focus on each breath and you slow down your mind and you gradually let the thoughts just drift in and out and away and drift by like little clouds. And you listen to, if you wish, to a prayer word. Uh, in the ancient Far Eastern tradition, they call it a mantra. And all it is is a word that will take away your other distractions. And in the Christian tradition, they use the word Maranatha. In the Eastern tradition, they go Aum. It's an Aum. That's got a whole bunch of syllables in it that are the word beyond all words, and it represents the idea of God. But you don't see anything visual, visual when you say this word or when you hear this word. What you're doing when you're breathing, breathing in, you, let's say, go Aum. You think it in your mind. You just think it. After a while, you'll feel that you're hearing the word. And sometimes it'll disappear when you're in a complete state of union, I believe, with God. The word will disappear. But you're not looking for pictures when you meditate. You know, your eyes are closed, but you're not looking to see anything. What you're really looking for is like a blank TV screen or a blank blackboard, just clearing your mind of thoughts, letting go, just letting go. And the aim, the simple aim, is emotional balance. So when we're meditating, what are we doing? Just a little review. We're just being. We're being quiet. We're being calm. I hold my hands this way. I just let my palms sort of rest on top of each other, and I put my two thumbnails together, and it's a kind of energy process that I believe that there's an energy that goes through us, and this sort of brings the energy together, and I breathe slowly into my abdomen, let it rise, not so much chest breathing, but abdominal. And I think my prayer word on the way in, and when I breathe out, I think nothing. I look for no visions, no words, just feel the silence, be one with the silence, be one with God. Let go, just be there, just be. And so it goes back to let go and let God. There are various styles of meditating, there are various approaches, like for example, you could use beads. I originally didn't use beads, but a friend of mine got these from Nepal and they were blessed by the Dalai Lama and gave them to me as a gift a few years ago. And so I use these. It takes me about 10 or 12 minutes to go through the breaths, the number of breaths that completes these beads. And so I know if I go through these twice, I've gone through the 20 minutes that I'm aiming for. Uh, I also put a little timer on and the timer either rings at 20 minutes, 25 minutes, or 30 minutes. I never do less than 20. I never do more than 30. And that's what I learned in the Benedictine tradition. Don't do excessive meditation and don't do minimal meditation. Do something in the middle. And that turns out to be healthy for me. No music, no rhythm, no distractions. A chair with arms in case you fall asleep and tilt sideways. Sometimes you fall asleep. The beads help me. I let the beads rest on the edge of my chair and if they drop, when I go, if I sleep a little bit, they'll make a little noise, and I notice that, pick up the beads, and continue. And that's an amazing assistance to staying alert while being still. So sometimes if you don't use the beads, it's harder to stay alert and stay still. And I do this in the morning. The recommended time is every morning, first priority, is do the 20 minutes to 30 minutes of meditation. One time to me in a dream, and I'm going to give you this message, it's on the screen now, I got this message. It said, the work comes first, everything else second. And ever since then, I've been putting the work of meditation first in my life and letting everything else take its own place and work its way into the day. And it's a much calmer way of existence. 
So the concept is 20 minutes discipline each day, discipline. But you can start off with two minutes and you might work up to a week or two and do five and t in a week or two later you're up to ten and just do it gradually. There's no need of plunging into the twenty minutes and thinking like it's a kind of torture. Eventually you find that you love to meditate. You'll find that it's, it's not even a problem making it the first priority in your life. And then at the end of the day it's a little more difficult to squeeze it in. But I try to do this before supper in the evening and if not sometime later in the evening, no matter where I am. I don't care where I am. I've meditated in parking lots. I've meditated in hotel rooms. I've meditated under trees at the ocean. I've meditated in all kinds of places. It's a priority in my life. I recommend that to you if you want to develop your spiritual basis and your spiritual discipline. So what, what's the point of it all? The point of it all is to find the middle way. Meditation means the middle. The word media in Latin is in there. The middle. The middle is where we find most peace in life, not with the extremes. And the addict usually goes for the extremes. That's the part of us that wants excitement or ends up getting depressed. And the reason we get depressed most of the time is because we've gone too high. And that pushes us down into the depression when we come off the high, even if we're not taking drugs, even if it's overwork or you name it, over fun. In Tibet, the prayer word mantra, the mantra means mind protection. And what it does is it's like a, it, it, it helps empty our head of thoughts. And it's the space between the thoughts where we find eternity. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to get upset if, you, if your mind puts thoughts in there during your 20 minutes or your 30 minutes of meditation. Sometimes my mind is giving me words and thoughts for 15 minutes or more out of my meditation, but if in between those thoughts there's a space of any kind, that's the perfect kind of eternal space, and it, that's beyond measurement. So in this culture we tend to measure everything. We don't need to. We just need to be with the meditation. Just be. Just relax. Just empty the head of thoughts. If thoughts come in, let them be. And it's amazing how they fade away. And then you find these moments of incredible peace in between the words and the thoughts. And um, the mind, mind protection was the, the, the concept in the Far East, and I think it works well. I love the, con the idea of blending the East and the West, you know, taking some of what we learned in the Christian tradition and other traditions here, and then blending those with the Buddhist tradition, the Hindu traditions, and other traditions on the other side of the world. I think if we take both and blend them together, we really end up with something special. So we don't need to measure, we don't need to compete, you're not trying to be the perfect meditator, you're just trying to improve. You're not striving for any kind of a goal except to let go of your thoughts. It's an interesting concept. And when the thoughts come in, you don't struggle with them, you just observe them and let them come and let them go. And what happens is after a while, you, it's not as much of a problem anymore to have too many thoughts. And you'll never end up with a completely blank slate for all 20 minutes or you'd be dead. So you don't have to really worry about that. How much of my 20 minutes do I clear my screen? And do I rid myself of thoughts? Don't even think in terms of ridding oneself of thoughts. Just let them go. What you're dealing with is emptiness. When we really get down to who we are and we stop everything and just listen, we feel the emptiness and it can be very uncomfortable for a while until you get to like it. And that's why I say we need to learn to use the emptiness to handle emptiness because emptiness is what is inside us. Emptiness is what that secret place that Jesus was talking about is all about. Emptiness is what's really with us all the time and that's why nothing will fill that emptiness satisfactorily in life, nothing. Nothing, no thing, nothing will fill the emptiness for us. No human being will do it, no place will do it, no home will do it, no car will do it, no food will do it, no sex will do it, no drug will do it, nothing, no thing will fill the emptiness. Those are facts of spiritual life. Nothing will fill the emptiness except emptiness. So that's where meditation comes in and prayer. If you allow yourself to be empty and feel the emptiness and get used to the emptiness, you find peace because that's when you're in the spiritual dimension. And your feelings of separation and alienation will disappear. And you become closer to all of the people, places, and things. It's an amazing paradox. By getting in touch with the emptiness, I also then get in touch with the fullness of life. 
and in other people, places, and things. It's an amazing process. I become one with the universe, I become one with self, others, and God. I realize that God's in me and outside of me. I experience the presence of a loving God. God becomes my friend, my companion, not my enemy, not someone that's punishing me for my actions. He lets me live, he lets me learn. The fruits of meditation, among them, forgiveness of self, others, and God, and we can even have to forgive God sometimes because we can tend to blame God for what we ourselves have created or what someone else has done to us. Uh, we learn to be more comfortable with life. We develop an attitude of gratitude instead of an attitude of, of greed. Uh, we reduce our craving and we gradually soften those unselfish impulses and desires. Meditation is a kind of a journey. It's a journey away from selfishness and self-centeredness to unselfishness to oneness with others and with the world. We don't become perfect. We still have all that range of feelings that God gave us when we were born, but we try to find the middle. And the middle way is the way that we're after, and that's the way that brings serenity. So meditation is the middle way. And practicing it on a daily basis, twice a day, 20 minutes to 30 minutes, helps us to be more moderate people, more reasonable people, more spiritual people. It slows down our racing minds. And it, it even cleanses and purifies our body, our mind, and our spirit. And it helps us to accept our imperfections and other people's imperfections. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? it? Sounds like almost like a cure-all. It is. It actually is. If the whole world, everyone in the world were meditating on a regular basis, we wouldn't have any violence. We wouldn't have any wars. There'd be no need for it. Instead of chasing highs and lows, we'd be going for the middle way. We'd be uplifting ourselves with our energy. We'd be gaining a quiet understanding of ourselves and other people. We'd be wise and we'd learn to do nothing twice a day for 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And we'd get out of this freedom and power and a wonderful journey. And that leads us to our final graphic about the recovery process. It's, it's not an event. It's not a one-shot thing. It's a journey. It's a process. And that's the message I want to leave with you. And I think that the meditation part of the journey is an extremely important part. And I want to thank you for being with us on Understanding Addiction.